morning to you, and welcome to our Sunday School Hour. I'm going to ask you to turn with me to hymn number 19. Brother Ben Post is in Seward this morning helping uh, fill the pulpit there, so I have got the song leading duties for us this morning. So hymn number 19, I'm going to encourage you to sing out so you don't hear me. Hymn number 19, to God be the glory. that last verse let's work on smiling while we sing i know it's tough to sing and smile but at least have a demeanor or a a a, a, a look about you that you're happy about what we're singing about. we're singing about the salvation that the lord has blessed us with the god be the glory for that uh, verse number three great things great things he has done. Appreciate that. You can be seated and uh, take out your prayer request, your uh, prayer sheet, the uh, notes that we had out there. If you didn't pick one of those up, make sure you uh, stop by and get those as you come in. Those front and back doors both have the uh, Sunday school notes on them, and there's some space there for some prayer requests. Uh, a couple things I want to share with you. One of those would be, uh, I just want to continue, if you would, pray for Dave Disney. I have not mentioned him the last couple of weeks, but still, so far as we understand it, he's got clots he's dealing with both in his legs and his lungs on top of uh, cancer. So he's just got a lot right now in his health in regards to uh, just needs our prayers. I pray for our missionary, Brother Dave Disney. Brother Dan Monahan, as you would know, has surgery April 19th. So pray about that, that the Lord would just allow that to go smoothly, go be, uh, be able to accomplish exactly what they need to accomplish there. So again, that's about a week and a half or so from now, uh, Miss Lori Abbott is scheduled still for surgery on the 26th. Again, if you would pray for those A1C levels to be uh, down so that she can have that surgery. Uh, again, just with our prayer request right now. I think she has that test done tomorrow. Hopefully, we'll be able to find out some results on that here soon. So pray for her. Again, surgery right now scheduled for the 26th of this month. I want to continue praying for Brother Mitch Holmes' recovery from his shoulder surgery. Things are going well there. We thank the Lord for that. I want to continue lifting up before the Lord. Also, uh, Ashley Morton, this is Miss Becky's husband, was supposed to have surgery last week on his back, and they, I think, had to postpone that or reschedule that. Some th things going on with his knee there, so continue praying for Ashley Morton. I meant to mention this uh, Wednesday. I failed to, uh, but Calvary Baptist Church, as you would know, they've been without a pastor for a number of months uh, due to Brother Tim uh, 
passing unexpectedly. And they did have a candidate come, back, come through a couple of weeks ago, and they voted, I think it was last Sunday, and said that, you know, they just didn't feel like the Lord would have them to have that individual come and be the pastor. And so what we've been praying is that the Lord would make it very clear, and he did do that. And so we're thankful that the Lord has given clear direction to that church regarding that particular uh, situation there. So pray, though, that the Lord would uh, lead that right man to the position and uh, certainly we want to just, again, you imagine what it would be like without having a pastor. They've got a, almost a new guy in there every week preaching. Thankful, again, for our men who've been out there. A number have been, have been committed to doing that. We appreciate that. But it is tough to be without a pastor like that. So pray for that church, uh, Calvary Baptist, if you would. Uh, pastor Lydic is in Oklahoma City, uh, Oklahoma now, just traveling all over the place down there and then teaching in the school during the week. He and Miss Sandy are both down there now, so pray for him today. As, as I mentioned, Brother Ben is out in Calvary, uh, at Calvary today. I uh, want to continue praying for Gary Hatfield over in Japan. And then also a number of folks, I, I noticed as we were uh, just going through some prayer requests here, we've got a number of folks out traveling uh, this week, so pray for safety. So many of those will be traveling back this week. And then, of course, we have Easter Sunday next Sunday. I want to pray about that. Pray that we'd also have a great time next Sunday night with the cantata. I know the choir has been working diligently to be prepared for that. I'd ask some of the choir members, how we doing? Are you feeling good about it? I <laughs> look forward to They're ready or not, right? It's about a week away, so I know there would be some practices, I think, even throughout the week here uh, this week. But excited about that. I really am uh, looking forward to what the Lord has uh, for us that evening. So, again, that's next Sunday night. If you haven't taken some flyers, those are available on the front tables there. Do that. Invite your neighbors, friends, coworkers, anybody you think would be able to bring along with that and be back again for that night. I look forward to some time together that evening. Then I also want to pray about the Avery North neighborhood. That's the neighborhood we began yesterday with our All Church Outreach. Had a had a good a good results there, some good visits, good contacts that we'll be following up on later this month. So I want to thank those who were able to be here for that. And that Avery North neighborhood is really where our focus is right now with our door knocking. Okay? Any other prayer requests? Briefly, if you have anything you'd like to share with us, make sure we have that added to our list. Yeah, Brother John. Anybody else? <laughs> yes, Dad. So my niece, Amy, um, she has been having really strong feelings for her father. Um, she met her father for the first time two days ago, and this is the first time she's ever actually seen her father in person. Um, so that's just kind of a new thing for her. Um, sure, yes. She just yes. Um, and just, just to ask the Lord that she would be able to really accept the situation and feel like that this is the right time to accept the Lord. Yes. Miss Tabitha's aunt, Penny. Anybody else? Yeah, Miss Vicki? Vicky's granddaughter, Scarlett. You said that was Wednesday? Yes, next Wednesday. So, wait a few months there. Anybody else? Well, like I said, pray for Brother, um, Brother Gary there in Japan. Some is Aaron. Pray for Christian. I meant to mention him as well, that he's uh, on alert and on duty. I don't know where exactly he is in the world right now, but pray for him. I know he's also away from family. Anybody else have prayer requests? Not everyone? Going once, going twice. Okay, let's go ahead and take a moment then, class, and we'll pray. Father, we thank you for this time that we can have to come before you collectively again as a church as a Sunday school class, we can um, come and bring these things to you, Lord. We're grateful that you are the God who already knows, Lord, the things that have been mentioned here tonight or this morning and the things that have not been mentioned, Lord. There's a number of things that we could certainly uh, give attention to in our prayers, Lord, and you already know, and we thank you for that. Uh, Lord, there are uh, some needs here that we want to 
bring before you and just ask that you would give uh, the healing uh, help that's needed. Lord, we think about Dave Disney. He is, his health is just in a very bad place right now. And Lord, just trust that you're going to give him grace to endure what you've called him to endure with the right spirit and the right attitude. And Lord, certainly our, we don't understand why something like this would would altogether happen to a missionary who's looking to be on the field, wants to be serving you there in Chile, and, and cannot right now. We we know, though, that you uh, your ways are higher than ours, and you have purposes that we can't always understand or see. And Lord, so we take great uh, faith and, and assurance in that and trust that where he is right now, you would, again, minister through him, help him, would help that church in Chile, uh, Lord, as they uh, continue on without the missionary main church there in Santiago and some other churches that the uh, Disney's have had a great impact in uh, Lord just trust that you work in spite of the fact that they're not able to be there right now uh, we think of our brother Monahan, brother Dan as he has surgery scheduled for later this month please uh, we trust that that would go smoothly uh, father we want to just ask that when that procedure does take place there would be no hiccups no uh, issues there and everything would go as it should we think pray the same thing for miss Lori as she uh, also has surgery for this later for later this month we, we trust that you're going to allow that to be uh, to accomplish what needs to be accomplished there we pray that it wouldn't be a pushback father they would be able to have that on the 26th of this month and and trust that the um, again Lord you just allow that door to be open for her we pray for uh, Ashley Morton miss Becky's husband and, and want to just pray for his health and Lord the need that's there and the next steps that would be for him and the surgery Lord we pray that you'd give direction to his doctors thank you for the surgery brother Holmes had I know it's not an easy thing but uh, we do trust that he's able to put all the injuries that he's endured from a couple years ago behind him and be able to truly move forward Lord with uh, his health now father we pray again for his recovery uh, father for miss tab's aunt uh, penny and uh, lord and just her her overall health obviously isn't good at all but even just her her um, her mental health and just not being able to be home and just how distressing that must be to be uh, kept from where you want to be lord and, and lord so i just pray that you'd help her uh, in this time that she's in lord and, and of course the need for salvation being there father we Pray that you might use uh, people in her life right now to help her see the need that she has. Uh, we think of Scarlett, Miss Vicky's granddaughter, um, and the procedure that they're doing. That the uh, we think the tests that they're going to have next Wednesday, and uh, we just trust that you would uh, again there be no no issues, no reason for more uh, further surgery there, and uh, be able to just give her a clean uh, bill of health on that father and her vision. Uh, Lord, we want to pray for uh, those who are away this morning. We think of Brother Ben as he's in uh, Seward. Please bless him and them with a, a great time together today. And, of course, we want to lift that church up before you ask that you'd meet the need for a pastor there. We pray for uh, Father, Brother Gary, and uh, Brother Christian as they are away right now. Please keep them safe, Lord. I trust that you bless their families while they're away. Father, for Pastor Lydic as he travels there in Oklahoma. And it's just really all over the place different churches he's preaching and we thank you for the ministry that you've allowed him to have there and trust that you'd be with him while he travels he and miss sandy father for also lord the others who um lord, would be here today but are uh, on vacation or for whatever reason are traveling right now we just trust that you give safety to each one uh, lord we pray for uh, this week uh, lord exciting week as we move towards easter sunday next week lord we're excited about that and trust that you'd give us a wonderful day in your house as we celebrate the resurrection of our savior we pray for the cantata to, uh, next sunday night and again all the work that's going into that we, we thank you for the choir and their willingness to put in that time and that effort lord and pray that we would just have a wonderful service that evening as we hear the the resurrection story presented in song lord we're excited about that and just ask that you'd uh, allow us to have a number of, of guests with us that evening uh, Lord, as the gospel is presented. Uh, Father, want I even pray that way this morning as we give attention to 1 Corinthians 15. And uh, Lord, there's some, some wonderful gospel truths that we're going to be looking at this morning and trust that you would just open the eyes of those who might not know you as their Savior. I pray you'd help them realize their need uh, for Christ and they would respond as they should, we pray. Uh, thank you for the time we have this morning. I trust that you bless our study. In Jesus' name we ask it. 
Go ahead and take out your notes. If you Again, if you didn't get a note, uh, the notes there, I encourage you to find a piece of paper to take some notes on. And then turn, to, turn with me to Mark chapter 16. You'll notice Mark 16 is not 2 Peter chapter 2, which is where we are in our series. Uh, as I said last week, taking a little bit of a break there. wasn't in, even anticipating to take a break this week and next, but uh, just felt like it was for a good cause. Our focus this morning and next Sunday, Lord willing, is on the resurrection of our Savior. Some of this comes, obviously, as we are just in the time in which we are in the year right now. And uh, so I wanted to share some of that. Just really want to impress upon you, if I can, the things we're looking at this morning is an importance of not just kind of knowing about them, but having a working knowledge of the things we're going to cover today. And so let me encourage you, pull out a piece of paper. And uh, what we're covering is something that is very conducive to taking notes. Let me encourage you to take notes, take detailed notes, and be sure that you're, you're ready to follow along on some of these things. So yesterday, my wife and I, we were out at uh, All Church Outreach, teamed up together, and we were knocking doors in that Avery North neighborhood. And the first door that somebody uh, was home for was a young lady our age. I say young because she was our age. And so <laughs> uh, we, uh, we, we knocked this door, and she comes to the door. My wife, uh, of course, her being a lady, my wife began to talk to her. And uh, she responded. We kind of went through the normal greeting there and just, hey, we're from Midlands Bible Baptist Church and want to invite you to church. And she said, well, I'm not interested. I'm an atheist. And so my wife began to talk with her about that and talked to, got a little bit of her background and, and some things to think about. We kind of discussed some things about that and uh, just uh, gave her a quick synopsis of the gospel. It took about three or four minutes with her. And then we moved on to the next door, left her some literature and, and things like that, and even took her address. And so maybe going to try to send her some things to think about. But that's not, if, you've, if you're talking to people about the gospel or about Christ, you understand that that's not uncommon to come across people who, are, who profess to be atheists or agnostics or others who would say, I don't believe in, in religion at all. That's not uncommon. In fact, I, as I was doing some research, even last Sunday, I shared with you some of these statistics, but based on the census data for Sarpy County, this is the, the, the county that we are in, there are, are, are 92,000 who identify in the, the none category. You say, what is that category? It's the category that says, I don't identify with any religion. It doesn't necessarily mean that they're atheists, but it just says, I'm not affiliated with any church or churches or group of churches out there. I, I'm not affiliated with anybody at all. 58% of the people in Sarpy County identified that way. Uh, again, doesn't mean that they're atheists, but it does indicate an overall trend. In fact, I've got art articles and some, some uh, newspaper articles I've read here just recently. I wanna, don't have the time to share with you this morning, but, but that have, have indicated that, there are, that that is the direction our country is going. It's not becoming more and more religious. It's, coming, it's becoming less and less so. And more and more of those who would identify with the nuns. I doubt this is a shock to you this morning, but that lady that we talked to yesterday, she does not believe Jesus Christ rose from the dead. That it surprise anybody. She might believe Jesus was a real man. I don't know. We didn't get into all of that. She might have believed that Jesus even died. But I can pretty much guarantee you, being an atheist, she does not believe, does not and will not believe, did not believe that Christ bodily rose again from the grave. He was dead and then he became alive again. I am very certain that she does not believe that. As you are aware, one of the most controversial and hotly discussed and contested topics in theology is this subject we're covering today, the resurrection of Christ. It is something that is attacked by those who do not know Christ, who those are, are anti-Christian. You say, why so? Well, because the resurrection of Christ is the core of Christianity. If you take away the resurrection, you really, you take away Christianity. Christianity has no leg to stand on. If the resurrection is true, if we can show it to be true, if, people, if we can have people come to a place where they believe it to be true, then you really, you receive Christianity as a whole. You say, well, if Christ actually is God and he died for our sins and then he rose again, if that's actually happened, it verifies, it authenticates Christianity. But on the flip side, if the resurrection did not happen, Christianity is really a pointless, 
I'd say, a worthless religion. There's maybe some good ethics you might be able to take from it, but if the resurrection did not take place, the core of Christianity is completely removed. And the idea that there is a Savior who can save us from our sins, who can offer forgiveness, that's gone. That's why Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, we are of all men most miserable if the dead rise not, if Christ be not raised. Our faith is in vain. We are yet in our sins. Therefore, eat and drink for tomorrow we die. That's, that really should be our life's motto if the resurrection's not, in fact, true. If it's true, it changes everything. If it's not true, it changes everything. Regardless, the resurrection, it, you could say it is the pinnacle, it is the, 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 uh, the top or the, the, the highest point of Christianity. And again, everything rises and falls on this. That being said, as I, as I said before, the resurrection of Christ is something that is often attacked. And so what we're going to do this morning and what we're going to do, Lord willing, next week as well is to try to just give some proofs or some reasons why we ought to believe the resurrection. Now, I want to make sure we cover this here before we go any further. Mark chapter 16 says Christ rose again. Matthew 28 says the same thing. Luke 24 says the same thing. John 21 says Christ rose again. A lot of other places we can go that say Jesus rose again. The Bible makes that point pretty clear. And for most in this room, I say maybe even everyone in this room, that's enough. You believe the Bible. The Bible says Christ rose. Therefore, I don't need to wonder about it. I don't have any doubts. And let me just say to you this morning, that's fine. You don't need to have all these extra proofs to, uh, to support your faith. The faith that you have placed in the Bible and in a risen Savior is enough. That being said, it is helpful for us when we talk to somebody like the lady we talked to yesterday, who is an atheist. You know what she does not believe? Mark 16. She doesn't believe what Matthew 28 says. She would look at the Bible and say, that's man's opinion. That's a lot of, uh, you maybe that it could be an historical document, but I don't believe it's inspired. I don't believe this is God breathed. And so you might place all your faith in it, but I don't. And in, in reasoning with somebody like that, it is helpful to be able to say, the Bible is not the only way, the only thing you can point to that proves or supports the resurrection. Does that make sense? So it's helpful for us. Yes, it can be a support to our own faith, but we don't need it. We've got the word of God. But it is very helpful for those who are not yet where we are, who say the word of God is inspired. The word of God is preserved. I can trust the word. I can build my life upon this book. A lot of people aren't there yet. And to help them get to that point, it is helpful to have some proofs or some supports to this doctrine. And so that's why I'm encouraging you to... Write these things down again for your own sake, but more so for the sake of others who you will have opportunity to talk to. Because as I said, the, the direction of our country is more and more so not finding people that's, that are saying, oh, the Bible says it, I believe it. That's not the mindset anymore, as you know. So what are some of these proofs? We've got actually 10 of them I want to share with you. And so we're not going to get through all 10 of them t this morning. I'll be happy if we can get to five, you know, half today, half next week, but that's probably at this point not looking very likely. So be back again next Sunday if you would, please. I want to make sure we cover these if we can. The first one I want to share with you is this. The resurrection, and this is what I encourage you to write these down. The resurrection is supported by the fact that Christ died, okay? And you say, why is that a support for the resurrection? Well, before you can have a resurrection, you need to have a, a death. Okay, that's, it. that's that's deep, Pastor. I, I appreciate that you, you understand that. Uh, some will say, listen, some will say Jesus never, some will say he never existed. Some will say he never died. Some would say that he, he may have gone through the process of being crucified, but didn't actually die. Some would say that he, he, uh, he uh, they, they use the swoon theory. Have you heard of that before? The swoon theory basically says that on the cross, he passed out. 
All right, he did not die, he passed out. And so the soldiers there who were professional killers didn't realize he was dead and they thought he was dead and they took him off the cross, he was buried. And then in a cold, dark grave for three days, this man who's been crucified um, came back to where he was conscious again, moved the massive rock and got out. That, that's the swoon theory, all right? And that's, a, you know, that's my take on it. There's, there's other ways, obviously, it wouldn't be presented that way. Uh, somebody else who would maybe cold to that theory. But you look at, again, the, the different ways in which people would try to disprove it. Some would go this route and say, well, he never died. He never died. He, he, he passed out. He, he had some type of way in which he, he looked or appeared to be dead, but was not. You say, how do you refute that argument? Well, historically, you go to the Gospels. And there, there, there's a whole idea of the, the gospels being a historical account. You don't have to refer, you don't have to believe that are to be inspired, but you can believe that they are historical documents, just like we have many of other, you know, the writings of Josephus and others and others that we can point to that even are not the gospels that say Christ was crucified. But then you go through the process of what a crucifixion is and what a person endures when they go through a crucifixion. Let me just tell you this. As you know, a crucifixion was meant to kill people. You didn't, survive this method of execution the romans were pretty thorough and in the case of christ not only was he on the cross um, crucified they made sure the job was done with the spear as you recall they they thrust they thrust the spear into his side that would have gone through up through his ribs underneath his ribs up into his lungs and even pierced the heart as water came out that was an indication they got the heart jesus was not, was not unconscious he was dead. It begins there. Okay, so let me just make sure that point is clear. It's supported by the fact that he died. He was buried, okay? He was buried, and again, you don't bury people who are alive. These Roman soldiers, these centurions, they did this all the time, and they knew what a dead body looked like. Christ was dead. Again, it's the, there's a lot more that we could say about that, but let's just, let's just all that, say that that's, I think, sufficient there. Here's the second one. I want you to write this down. The resurrection is supported not just by the death of Christ. It's supported by the fact that his tomb was empty. The fact that his tomb was empty. The fact that his tomb was empty is really not disputed by anyone. Even, listen, even your, your hardcore atheist will not say, oh, his tomb really wasn't empty. There's biblical record, there's extra biblical record that says his tomb was in fact empty. You could go to New Testament scholars who will agree with that. Other doctors, other who would not be even, you'd say, Christians. A man named Van, D.H. Van Dalen, he's, a, he's an atheistic uh, historian. He says it's extremely difficult to object to the empty tomb on historical grounds. It just, there's, no, there's no proof, there's no evidence for it. One of the most well-attested facts in the gospel accounts and outside the Bible. And we can go to Matthew 16. Our, our, I want to spend some time in the Bible this morning because this is Sunday school. We ought to do that. But look at verse number five. It says, there is the account of Christ's resurrection here. And entering, these are the, the young women, ladies who had come to the tomb. And entering into the sepulcher, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, clothed in long white garment, and they were affrighted. And he saith unto them, be not affrighted. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, with which crucified. He is risen. He is not here. Behold the place where they laid him. They were affrighted. They could not, could not produce Jesus' body. This is one of the ways in which you might go about showing the, the proof or the truth of this point. When someone says, well, was he really resurrected? Was the tomb really empty? Well, if it wasn't empty, and in Acts, when the, the gospel begins to explode and blossom and people are getting saved and the Jews, the Jewish leadership are saying, we don't want this to happen. What would have been a good way to kind of squelch that? What would have been the way that you and I would have said, well, these bunch of believers, some of a bunch of radicals here who believe this guy rose again. How can we disprove what they believe? Go to the tomb, open it up, pull out his dead body and say, he's not alive. You want to see it? Here it is. Produce the body. Would that have disproved Christianity when it first kind of began there in the, the book of Acts? Probably. I'm fairly certain people wouldn't have been giving their lives for a, for a cause that was predicated on 
a man who rose again when his body was in that, gr that grave over there. You can go and look at it if you want. I don't know about you, but I'm not going to die for a cause that, that is clearly not true. And so if they, if they wanted to, they could have produced the body. In fact, no doubt they wanted to, but the thing is they couldn't. Again, one of the most commonly accepted, one of the most well-established historical truths about the resurrection is that the tomb was in fact empty. It was in fact empty. Look at the, the next proof or support here. Number three, the resurrection supported by the woman being the first to see him alive. The first to see him alive. You say, how does it, how is that a proof? Well, let's take a look at it. The gospels make it clear, Mark does in the other gospels as well, that the women followers of Christ, female disciples were the first to see him and the first to believe he rose again. They were the ones taking spices and ointments to the the grave. They were going to anoint his body, try to squelch the smell. That was part of the process as they would go and, and they would lay these herbs and ointments and things on there to try to, to, to alleviate some of the stench that would come from a de decomposing body. Look at the, the verse, verse number one there in Mark 16. It says, and when the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene, using specific names, it's not just a bunch of women. It's here's some names, even more precise Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James and Salome, had brought sweet spices that they might come and anoint him. Look at verse number two. Here's the problem they faced very early in the morning, the first day of the week. They came into the sepulcher at the rising of the sun, and they said among themselves, who shall roll away the stone from the door of the sepulcher? We're not going to be able to get in. Skip down to verse number nine. Now, when Jesus was risen early the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene. Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had cast seven devils. The very first person, according to this passage, and also again in John chapter 20, first person to see the risen Christ was Mary Magdalene. John chapter 20 gives a more full account that in the garden there, she, she doesn't realize who it was that was talking to her. And she thinks he's the gardener. You remember that account there in John 20? Where have you moved his body? That was the idea. You, you've moved his body. Tell me where it is and we'll take him. And then she, the, uh, Jesus says to her, Mary. And she says, Rabboni, master, the light kind of comes on. You're not the gardener. You're Jesus. You're Christ. And so the light comes on for her. These women were the first to, to hear and to see the empty tomb. They were the first ones to see the risen Christ. He said, how is that a proof? Well, if you were trying to build a belief or a religion or a movement on a claim like this, that there was a man who was crucified, but then he came alive again. God raised him from the dead. If you were trying to establish that statement or that truth, you would not use women as your primary witnesses or as the first ones to witness the, the life of this person. You say, why not? Well, again, it's not our society, but it was for them, women's testimony was not credible. It was not accepted into a court of law. You couldn't say, well, this, this woman saw what happened and so she can testify, it wasn't allowed. Only men could testify in a court of law. It was really only a man's word that had any weight or any bearing. You say, that's not right. It's, you're right, it's not right. But that was how it was that women didn't have a voice to speak the truth. And so you say, I want you to establish a claim that is going to seem ludicrous to pretty much anybody who hears it. I'm going to use as my primary witnesses, my first eyewitnesses to the truth of this account. I'm going to use women. That doesn't make sense. In other words, if it was a product of man's thinking, if this was a scheme or a, or a plot by the disciples, they wouldn't have said, let's make our, our first witnesses a bunch of ladies, which wouldn't have happened. This was a product of man. It would have gone an entirely different direction. And so the testimony of women, the fact that these women were the first to see him alive speaks to the fact that this is a true thing that happened. What the gospels are saying about it is actually true. Again, if it was a product of man, it would not have been written like this. It would have been a much different way that it would have unveiled. It would have unrevealed. There's another, by the way, I, I've, I'm just realizing this. I'm not preaching. I'm supposed to be teaching here. 
So we've just covered three, <laughs> three proofs. Let me just take a minute. Have, have, is there any questions that have come up yet? I, I've meant to do that after every one of the points I made, and I just like again, I'm pre- preaching mode, and, and don't do that. So any any questions that you say? I'm not sure about this, or could you explain that more, or maybe even just a comment? We've got some time. We're actually doing pretty good for time. Anything that have, up to this point you say I'm not sure about, or I've not heard that yet, or or I'm not sure I got that, or sorry, you kind of should be asking you again. So I'll, I'll ask you again at the, after this point. If I don't, just kind of say, Pastor, make sure. If you got a question, raise your hand because I will I will stop. I not stop right away, but I will stop and get back to you on that. Okay, give it, Sean. Appreciate that, Brother Sean. I know you'd shared your testimony with me about how that, what was the man's name again? Remind me. Christopher, Christopher yeah. O- over the course of months, sharing not necessarily scriptural verses, though that I'm sure had a part in it, but it really was a matter of bringing somebody to the place where they could accept what scripture says based on some other proofs. So, yeah, I appreciate that, Brother Sean. Number four. All right. Number four. Anybody else? Make sure we give you a chance to. All right. Number four. The resurrection is supported by the embarrassing details surrounding the resurrection. The embarrassing details surrounding the resurrection. There are a lot of details that if this was just a product of man writing these things down, you know, Matthew and John and Peter and everybody, they kind of come together in that upper room there and say, all right, we need to come up with a story here to try to, make this movement continue because obviously Jesus isn't here anymore. He's been crucified. He's in the grave. And so therefore, if we want to see this movement continue, we've got to come up with a story here. Let's write the rest of the account down and, and we'll, we'll, we'll put it out there as true and people will hopefully believe it and you know, it'll continue to move on. If that happened, you would likely not see a lot of the details that we see in the Gospels. So what type of details? Well, Look at, well, again, even before we look at some verses, you have the idea that these men throughout, even before you get to the crucifixion, this Passion Week, before then, they are presented earlier in the Gospels as, um, I've just used the word this way, goobers, as, as men who just are, are often just nowhere near where Jesus is in regards to trying to communicate and trying to understand things. Jesus is here, and they're way off in left field. You say, that's not how you typically present yourself. If you're, if you're coming up with a story, you don't typically put yourself out there as uh, the, the, uh, the idiot who couldn't grasp the truth that the teacher was trying to say. That's not typically how you present yourself. You're going to present yourself in the best light possible. And so if they were coming up with these things, that's not how they would have said it. The fact that they all forsake him in the garden, that's um, a bunch of sissies. And we would look at that and say, I'm not sure I would have stayed there. These soldiers coming in, these Jewish soldiers coming in to arrest Jesus, I probably would have run off too. But again, that, if they were fabricating the story, you could have said, oh, we were there, we fought for him, we tried to save him, and they were able to overpower us and took him away. No, they all ran off, tucked tail and ran. And the heat was turned up. They were nowhere to be seen. You have another detail, obviously Peter, three times denying Christ. Would that be a part of the story you might leave out? probably would have if it was me I wouldn't have wanted everybody to know how I had said no I don't know him three times I wouldn't have wanted people to know that you look at his crucifixion there in chapter 15 look at verse number verse number 40 look at what it says there were also women looking on afar off among whom was Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James a lesson of Joses and Salome who also when he was in Galilee followed him and ministered unto him and many other women which came up with him unto Jerusalem. Say, what is, how is that an embarrassing detail? The disciples aren't here. The 12 are, are gone. And we know John was there for a while, but he didn't stay. He took Mary and they left. He said, who are, who's left to be with Christ? Well, it's his women followers. Again, for the men who would have been in charge of coming up with the new story, this was not an, a, you say, not a, a fact that attributed to their strength or their faith or their, no, this was a true detail that was embarrassing to those who were having to write it. Look at um, verse 42, the idea that his 
body, Jesus' body, had to be retrieved and buried by a member of the Sanhedrin. His disciples weren't even willing to go get his body. It talks about how Joseph of Arimathea, verse number three, an honorable counselor, which also waited for the kingdom of God, came and went and boldly unto Pilate and craved the body of Jesus. And Pilate gives him, eventually gives him the body. And basically he said, what's that detail about? Well, it's not the disciples. Again, the point we're making, it's not the disciples who are doing all this. Where are the disciples in all this taking place? They are hiding, hoping the Roman soldiers, the Jewish uh, leadership won't be able to find out where they are. They're, they're in different places. They've scattered. They've dispersed, trying to save themselves. He said the embarrassing details of the fact that, it, again, it was not the men that was there. It was the women that were there. It was not the men who were craving his body. It was a member of the Sanhedrin council. You look at chapter number 16. Again, there's so much that you could point to in, in these these verses here. I guess I'm going to kind of skip through some of this here. The embarrassing detail of the fact that, again, it was, in fact, you see it a little bit here in Mark, but you go to the other Gospels and you say, how slow the disciples were to believe the truth. The, the, the women come and they say, we've seen the Christ, we've seen him resurrected. Um, they go and they see the empty tomb themselves. Peter and John run and they see that, they go into the tomb, they realize he's not here. But you say, do they believe right at that moment? No, no. In fact, it's a good while longer before they actually do. And Christ actually has to appear to them in the flesh, in person, and say, here I am. Put your fingers in my, in my hands if you need to, to have faith and believe. The fact that they were so reluctant to believe the truth. Again, if, we was, if it was the disciples who were creating this story, it very likely would have read a good bit different. Again, if it was you and me coming up with a story about how this is going to transpire, I don't know about you, but I'm going to make myself a hero. Or at least I'm not going to embarrass myself. I'm going to put myself in a good light. And it's not how it was. And so that, what that does is what that, that's what it speaks to is this. It speaks to the truth of the record. If something's true, it's going to include both the good and the bad. And the Gospels do that. It includes both. All right. Let's look at that last one. We got just a couple minutes here. Number five, the resurrection is supported by the fact that he was seen alive by many witnesses. He was seen alive by many witnesses. Some, of, some would believe, many would believe, this is the most effective evidence that you can provide the eyewitness firsthand account of an event. Someone who actually saw what happened. You've got video proof you can show others, or if you have an eyewitness that was there and saw what happened, that'll go a long way in a court. That'll go a long way in a case when you've got somebody who was there who saw exactly what took place. In our account here in Matthew, you obviously have the ladies that, that see him alive, Mary Magdalene. Later on in, in verse 12, verse 13 of Mark 16, he appears to two of them on the way. That would be the Emmaus Road there. Verse 14 uh, of our passage here, look at, and afterward he appeared unto the eleven as they sat at meat and upbraided them with their unbelief and hardness of heart because they believed not them which had seen after he was risen. Uh, why don't you just flip over and you can keep, keep your spot in 1 Corinthians 15. That is where we're going to be uh, here in just a few minutes in our main worship uh, service this morning in 1 Corinthians 15. Uh, Paul, under inspiration here, gives a catalog of those who had seen him alive. In uh, verse number 3 and 4, he recounts the gospel and the fact that he was resurrected, rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Verse number 5 of 1 Corinthians 15. And that he was seen of Cephas, that was Peter, then of the twelve. After that he was seen of above 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this present but some are fallen asleep. After that, he was seen of James, then of all the apostles. And last of all, he was seen of me also as one born out of due time. He gives a list of those who had seen him. Is that an exhaustive list? No, it's not. But it is a catalog of those who, listen, those in Corinth who may have been doubting the resurrection. He says, listen, a lot of the people who saw him alive, they're still alive. If you wanted to, you could track them down and talk to them. And ask them, did you actually see him alive? Did you actually see his body? Did you see him walking around? Are, are you, are you an, a, a, a true witness? You can go and interview these people. I've seen all these ones. A firsthand witness account of the risen Christ. Some have thrown out the idea there's, there's the hallucination argument. 
that everybody who saw the risen Christ, they were hallucinating, having the, listen, the same hallucination, the same events. You've got the, again, it's, it doesn't happen where you have 500 people at once, this verse says, all having the same hallucination. It just doesn't take place. It doesn't happen. One commentator put it this way, those who believe in the hallucination theory, they want to substitute one miracle for 500 miracles. And that was what it would be for 500 different people to have the same hallucination about the risen Christ. Some have gone so far as to postulate that Jesus had a twin brother, a hidden brother who didn't show up on the scene until later on, uh, separated at birth, kept in hiding, and, and uh, again, shows up after Christ was resurrected. Again, that's a theory that's been used by some. It's For us, it would seem far-fetched. It would seem ridiculous. But when you begin to add up and stack up all this evidence, a lot of times people are left grasping at straws. There, there's not a lot of really good arguments to be had. I'm going to close with just uh, some information from, this is a cold case detective. His name is Warner Wallace. He says there are four questions to ask to determine if an eyewitness account is reliable. Was the witness actually there? Was they, were they present? All right. Do we have a witness that was there? We have many that were there. They lived it out. They were there. Is the testimony corroborated? Are there other witnesses that saw the same thing? Is that the case for this eyewitness account? Was it just one person who saw it? There's a lot of people who can corroborate what's been said. Is the testimony consistent? Is it accurate? Or does the story change over time? Well, it's very accurate, in my opinion, very accurate. Is there any motive for lying? Is there any motive? Well, a lot of these, particularly the apostles, are going to die for their testimony about the resurrection. And not just die, but gruesomely. They're going to be tortured and then killed for the fact that they won't renounce the resurrection. So is there motive for lying? There's motive for saying it did not happen, and yet it, they, were, they were consistent. And so you have basically the first five. Next week, Lord willing, cover the last five. And then I want to do also just a little bit of, say, application. I know today it's more of a, you say, an academic exercise, and I hope that you don't mind that. I hope that you, you don't come and have the expectation of being preached to. Sometimes we do need to take a more academic approach to some of these things. Because these are things we need to, as Brother Sean said, as we said earlier, these are things we need to know. Be, be, listen, be at our fingertips, at the, at the tip of our tongue, ready to share. When somebody says, well, I don't believe what the gospel says. You got anything else you could show me or share with me? <laughs> Absolutely. Um, just a couple minutes here. Brother Charles, did you have your hand up? Yes, sir. Josephus. He's a secular historian who was there, was able to uh, do a lot of the research and come to these conclusions. He's not somebody who's like Matthew or Mark coming and writing with a, you say, an ulterior motive. That's not Josephus at all. He's just trying to record history. Yes, ma'am, Rebecca. Dr. Daniel. what the form was. Yeah, I don't know that I have an answer for you right off the top of my head, Mr. Virginia. If you don't want it, mind me to get with you on that. Would be okay? Well, he, he would have, yep. Although the, the Bible does say that they were their vision was held so that they couldn't recognize him, these two men that he was talking to. But yes, he would have looked like um, there wouldn't have been anything, as far as I understand it, anything that would have said, oh, he's not, he would have looked like a man. Probably would have looked like what he did before, with the exception of the scars. Yeah, 
and Luke, the Bible talks about how they, they, their eyes were holding. I think it's how it's what the eyes were holding so that they could not see him or they could not recognize him. Eventually they do. The light kind of comes on, but um, for the first part of the time that they're with him, that they're, they're kept from understanding who exactly he is. Yeah. Okay, we do have to stop there. It gives you a little bit of a break here, so let's pray, and then we'll take about a 10-minute break. Father, thank you for what we've covered already this morning, and we look forward to what we still have yet to cover. Help us, Lord, to see that this is, this is a valid use of our time. We ought to uh, be well-equipped to share our faith, not just from the scriptures, but, Lord, from just the, the logical and the historical reasonings that we ought to have, Lord, to be able to help others come to a place where they can make that step of faith, to trust what the scriptures say, and to place their faith in a risen Savior. So thankful that you've done that work already in our hearts. Trust that you would only reinforce that belief in us, and Lord, look forward to what you would uh, do through this information in the future, we pray now. For your blessing on the rest of our morning together, in Jesus' name, amen.